This is Matthew McConaughey. Natalie Portman. James Patterson. Michael Ian Black. And you are listening to Five Questions with Dan Chabell. Welcome to Five Questions, Steve. Thank you. You retired from wrestling back in 2003, and we just witnessed The Undertaker, Mark Calloway, retire after 30 years in WWE. When you examine your entire wrestling career, what do you most want to be remembered for, and what do you see as the future of the business? I want to be remembered for the entertainer, the professional wrestler that I was. Uh, I never figured that I would reach the heights that I reached, and so I'm extremely proud of the fact that no one had ever bet on me or thought I was going to be the chosen one. And I never was. I, I worked myself into that position. I came up with the character uh, and grew into that character. And it turned into something that would, you know, turn into one of the greatest runs in the history of the business. Man, for the future of the business is really hard to see because we've been in a pandemic as we speak for quite some time now. And the WWE superstars, along with other organizations, have been, and you know, competing in front of empty arenas. And I talked to some of the top superstars in WWE just as of late, and they cannot wait. They're chomping at the bit to get back in front of a live crowd. So, you know, will this forever change the, the, you know, the business of pro wrestling or football stadiums or baseball arenas or, you know, any kind of gathering like that? When will it finally end? But, you know, the, the business always keeps evolving. It will always be here, in my opinion. And so it's turned into, you know, a much faster moving product than when I was around. And we turned it into a faster moving product than the guys 20 years before us. So it keeps evolving. It keeps, it keeps changing. And I just wish nothing but the best for it because I fell in love with the business at seven or eight years of age. I'm as big a fan now as I was when I was a kid. So I, I, I love to see that the men and women are able to, you know, have a roof over their head and provide a means of living for their family in this form of business. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up evolving and changing. This seems to be something that you've done quite well in your own career. I mean, now with, you know, a show and, you know, and doing all the podcasts, you've evolved and changed too after you retired. So I think that's so important because you still have a huge fan base and you still love entertaining. That hasn't gone away just because of the injury. And you went through a huge grind through your career from an intense travel schedule. A lot of wrestlers, you know, always remark about how insane the travels, you know, over 300 days a year uh, to injuries. How have you maintained a healthy lifestyle post-retirement? And what does your look, what does your diet look like these days? Man, the, the lifestyle on the road will take a toll on you. And I wasn't really ready to leave the business when I left it. And so now that I've kind of reinvented myself, I, I think it's always, you know, I think it's part of, you know, who, who and what we are, survival mechanism, you know, move on after you get over the, the whatever you had to leave, evolve into the next thing. And for me, if you'd have told me 20 years ago, hey, Steve, one of these days you're going to have an interview show on the WWE Network and you're going to have an interview show on USA Network where you hang out with cool people and do crazy things. I'd have said, you're crazy. But here we are. And, you know, I, I, and the key to anything or to anybody is to, to never give up and always persevere and, and keep, you know, working. If you always keep yourself in the game, you can, you, can, you can accomplish anything. So my diet now is a lot more strict than it used to be. You know, when we were on the road so much, traveling so much, going to the gym, doing cardio, in the ring every night, you can get away with almost anything because your activity level is so high. So, and when coronavirus hit, when COVID hit, you know, I put on that COVID-15 and it delayed our schedule for straight up Steve Austin. And I, and I was like, okay, man, I better dial it back because eventually we're going to get the green light and you know, I need to be camera ready. And this, you know, you want to look as good as possible. I don't look like a model, but you need to look as good as possible for television. Right. So just a very strict diet, uh, chicken, rice, uh, egg whites, my staples, uh, medium carbs to higher carbs on a training day, lower carbs on an off day, and consistency. Uh, one one meal out of the week is my cheat meal, and that was that is also when I will have my Broken Skull IPAs or my margaritas, whatever I choose to drink. But there's only going to be a couple of them, so very strict uh, as far as you know, like what anybody else can eat. I don't know, but I work out uh, probably with you know medium level weights rather than the heavier weights I was training at back in the day. But attention to detail, hiring a professional to help me, and consistency. 
Yeah. Consistency is really key to, to developing and maintaining any habits. And I'm a huge egg white fan, actually. I make an egg white omelet pretty much every day. And so I'm all for that diet. And I think that's been really effective. And I love how, again, you've evolved, you've adjusted your diet based on you know your activities now. And speaking of your show, which I highly recommend, you spend time with a variety of celebrities like Ice-T, who actually, I, I spoke with Ice-T at MIT, giving uh, different speeches on you know inspirational career advice many years ago. And he's amazing. And people underestimate how smart he is. And I think you've commented on that before. You know, Steve-O, who I've also interviewed, and Brett Favre. Uh, dur during the filming of Straight Up Steve Austin, what did you learn from your guests during these conversations and activities? They're exactly like I am, or you know, they're, they're normal people. And everybody that I've met so far has had a, a wonderful head on their shoulders and they've all, you know, persevered different things, overcame certain things, were super talented, so they surpassed certain things. Uh, you know, everybody's born with different talents. And, you know, it's like uh, with some of the stand-up comedians that I've talked to that, that are in front of working crowds like we were in the business of pro wrestling, you know, they, they're really a, a jack of all trades. And you know, like Brett Favre, I mean, he's just Mr. Cool you know, under any stressful situation, he's a guy that doesn't like to be serious and he keeps everything, you know, everything is chill with him. And that's, that's the way I discovered him to be when I met him and hung out with him. Ice T, you know, growing up, had a rough upbringing. And you ask that guy a question and you, he starts speaking. He's a charmer. He's very charismatic. And you're sitting under a learning tree of wisdom because he's been so many places and overcome so many obstacles and achieved so much success you know, he really is uh, just uh, wise beyond his years and a super, super guy. And I had actually worked on a project with Ice-T about almost a year before we did this episode. So, uh, and we'd already sent, sent out the invite to uh, be on the show and we ended up hooking up and having a great time, uh, but, but just a wealth of information and a salt of the earth human being. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because sometimes people say, oh, you're an actor, you're a wrestler, and there's a bigger picture. You know, it, it takes a lot of intelligence to be able to, you know, understand ring psychology. And it also takes a lot of intelligence to, you know, be part of, you know, a network show and, and getting prepared like you did in terms of your diet, but also, you know, coming like memorizing your lines or, or just knowing how to play off of different conversations. And, and that really comes, you know, takes us to the next question, which is in today's media world, authenticity is hard to come by. In fact, you know, people really don't trust the media or politicians or institutions, There's a lack of trust overall in our society. What is your secret to having authentic conversations with your TV show and podcast guests? Man, I am who, who I am and what I am. And, you know, my mom and dad, uh, we, we, had, we, we had our chores to do when we were growing up. And if you didn't do your chores, you know, there were consequences. And they always taught us to, to work our asses off in anything we chose to do. And one of my dad's favorite sayings to me was, Stephen, if you're going to do something, don't half-ass it the first time. So you got to come back and do it again. So anytime I approach something, I've given it my best effort. And uh, God dang, I segued from the question you, you, you asked me. Uh, but as far as the authenticity goes, I'm not trying to be anything other than what I am. Uh, when you, if you came into my shop and see all my, I, I don't have collectibles, I have junk. And my, my mother got me collecting antiques way back in the day. And one of the, one of the key things that my parents always uh, taught us from uh, a young age was never live beyond your means. When my dad would balance his checkbook, checkbooks are a thing of the past almost these days, but he would balance his checkbook. And uh, if he was a nickel off, he would say, Beverly, my, my mom's name was Beverly. And my mom would bring her checkbook in there and they would get together and find out where that nickel was. So they taught us to be uh, very wise with our money and to, to, to work hard. And I am who I am because of my parents. I love that. And Sorry, I was so long-winded with that. That was awesome. No, and I, I'm who I am because of my parents too. So I, I definitely relate to that. And I also like what you said about, you know, you're doing the best work. And in my opinion, if you do your best work and you really don't think you could have done better, you're not, you're going to live a life without regrets. I have no regrets because I did the best I could with the resources and talent and experience I had at that given time. So I'm not looking back and saying, man, I wish I could have done better because that was who I was at that time with 
the talents, the gifts, the experience that I had. So that, that's really important. And what's your best piece of career advice? I think the best piece of advice I ever got was save your money, kid. All the veterans in Dallas, Tennessee, WCW in Atlanta, all the places I went as a youngster, the advice was the same. Save your money. And to this day, I, you know, due to my parents and due to the veterans telling me that, I continue to do that. So important. And, and that doesn't have to, and, and it's not about money. It's just about never living beyond, never living beyond your means. So that, that's the best advice I ever got. Yeah. And you hear this so much in sports too, with like, you know, these, you know, football players, they make all, so, all this money, but then they spend it on these two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar cars and houses and everything. And then they get, they're broke after even making like five, $10 million off the first contract. So it, I think that's so valuable, but it's also for anyone. It's save your money. You never know when there's, in a sense, a pandemic recession, when you're really going to need it. And I really appreciated this conversation. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. I appreciate you having me and uh, catch you on the next one.